Hi, my name is Tyson Alchin. I run Alchin Acres LLC out of Columbus Junction, Iowa. Um, I owned a prior entity in Minneapolis, Minnesota, which was uh, Mushrooms for the Masses. But um, yeah, I guess everybody's here to learn a little bit about mushroom cultivation. The first thing I wanted to tell you all, if you don't feel like writing notes, don't bother. Just jot down my email address and I will send you the entire presentation. It will also be available on the PFI website. So if there's something pertinent you feel you really need to take notes of, go ahead. But otherwise, um, just be in the presentation. This is not meant to be all inclusive. Uh, I was just speaking with someone earlier about how lots of things in mushroom cultivation are constantly changing. Uh, the things that I knew for certain two years ago may not be how I feel about that now. So I want to cover a basic overview which will include the mushroom life cycle, uh, definitions of things used in growing mushrooms, making grain spawn, uh, choosing and preparing your substrate, pasteurization versus sterilization and what the difference is, inoculation, colonization, and fruiting, because that's what everybody wants to know about. Um, that picture was done in Minneapolis. A three-foot log, which is you know about this high, maybe less than a quarter of a bale of straw produced those four pounds of mushrooms which I sold promptly for ten dollars a pound. So everybody always asks in mushroom growing where do I get my spores and it's not the worst question in the world it's just a misinformed question because Spores by themselves don't do anything. Uh, spores have to first germinate, find a compatible spore that is also germinated, mate together, and then they become mycelium. Um, spores are like snowflakes in the fact that no two are exactly the same. Neither are their resulting um, combination when they become mycelium, that's called a strain. So if I were to grow from spores, there's no telling until way, way, way down the line after I've done all this work and effort, t trial and error about what I would yield out of this life cycle if I were to start from spores. So I don't start with spores. The only people that I know that grow with spores are people that produce psychedelics. Otherwise, people don't waste their time with spores. They buy established, ready-to-grow cultures that have already been determined, um, yields, biological efficiencies, things of that nature. So once the mycelium becomes so compound on itself, it'll form a hyphal knot, and that is what gives rise eventually to the mushroom fruiting body, which in the gills or teeth or pores, whatever the reproductive structure is on that particular mushroom uh, will produce the spores. And the only reason we ever get any of this stage to happen is the mycelium runs out of food. Mycelium is perfectly content to remain mycelium. There is, what, uh, 200, thousand acre, 20,000 acre armillaria structure that is under Oregon killing off widespread areas of trees. Um, the mushrooms only pop up from that when they've depleted its area's food source. And that's what we do in mushroom cultivation. We let the mycelium devour the food source and then we force the fruiting. So a spore print, a mass of spores taken under glass usually on something 
black paper, white paper, glass, something where you can identify and sector out where you've taken spores from already. Because dragging a dirty inoculation loop over a clean area is never going to yield good results. Multi-spore inoculation is if you were to take sterilized water, shoot it onto a spore print, draw up those spores, and then inject it into a media like agar on a petri dish. It'll grow, you just don't know what it's going to grow. And until you take the time to sector out one particular strain out of all those mushroom combination spores, uh, you're not going to know whether it's worth growing or not. A strain or culture is a specific combination that is yields desired results. You can get liquid cultures, you can get agar cultures, you can get uh, master slants, which are usually on agar. Uh, media is what you will finally grow the mushrooms out on, and spawn is usually uh, grain or sawdust that you use between your culture and your final substrate, what you're going to grow out on. Okay, so you start off with your known culture, put it on to, or spores, I guess, if you want to. If you really have a lot of time and you want to develop your own strain and get lots of money selling that strain, go for it. Because um, the way you can tell if somebody's ripping off your strain, you put a piece of your strain on a Petri dish and a piece of their strain on a Petri dish. If they grow together seamlessly, they're the same strain. If they grow together and form a wall where they meet, they're not. So if you did go through the time and effort to develop a strain, and somebody was like, oh, I have this amazing strain, you should try it. And this actually happened to Paul Stamets once, where somebody gave him back his own culture. <laughs> and he was like, where'd you get this? And uh, there was some trouble to be had. Anyway, once it colonizes the Petri dish, you put it into your uh, inoculant of choice. It could either be grain, sawdust, those are the two of the more common ones, but it has to be sterilized first because anything that your mushrooms cultures are going to want to grow on, lots of other things are going to want to grow on it too. Bacteria, um, other competing fungus, things of that nature. So that is, for the most part, the only part you have to sterilize something, which is not what any of the books written even up to maybe five years ago would have told you. Um, they say you gotta sterilize everything. It's just evolved to the point where we know a little bit better that it's not necessary. So you inoculate your grain, it grows out. You got a couple of different choices. You can lay your grain directly out into a tray form and grow it out that way. You won't get a lot of mushrooms, but you'll get enough for yourself, maybe. Or you put it into a bulk substrate. Use that bulk substrate to grow out one of these methods. Mound cultivation, bag culture, column culture, or wall culture. And I didn't take any pictures of wall culture. Um, basically where the U.S. has gone to upright fruiting columns or bags that sit on a level shelf, the rest of the world has stuck with um, taking their column bags and laying them on their side because they have a collar and a, a filter lid that fits on the end and to fruit they remove that well what they gain is one directional fruiting of the mushroom however you tip the bag if you were to put two bags like that colonized like this lay them down flat they would this one would fruit out this way this one would fruit out this way you could get a lot more efficient spacing versus if you were to take one block put it in the middle of the same space, cut the top open, <coughs> fruit mushrooms out the top, well that's great. 
but you can't stack another block on top of that. Where with bag culture, you can stack 5, 10, 15 bags because they're all fruiting out to the sides. And this is a little bit of my process. So this is my very first lab setup. And I purposely picked old pictures to put in this presentation so you could see some of the evolution. I used to uh, colonize my grain masters in half gallon wide mouth jars. Grow in straw, that's my friend Brian, and uh, culture in my backyard, open air, no special sterilized equipment outside of the lab. And this was my lab. A hep of bench, some petri dishes, my test tubes that have nothing in them, a, a culture fridge, and a scalpel sterilizer, and that is parafilm. And parafilm wraps around the petri dishes once you've inoculated them to keep anything from feeding out. This is my second lab. As you see, a little bit bigger, a little bit more equipment, a little more expensive. Okay, a lot more expensive. This initial setup uh, with the things that are pictured minus the refrigerator, the table, and the chair, and the bucket that I provided. All that equipment stuff was like almost $8,000 to start with. But I bought it all brand new, and I didn't make any of it myself. I bought it from a company that was already selling. This HEPA bench, this portion of it was made this one was the original one that you saw in the last picture. And that impulse sealer I bought after the fact too. But um, So you can make these and they're way cheaper to make if you have any kind of carpentry skills at all, which I'm not great at, but I made it and it works. And this is my current stage that's in uh, the process of being built right now. That HEPA filter is three foot wide by two foot high. Well, that HEPA filter is two foot wide by four foot high, and there's four of them in that HEPA bench. That window will be used to throw inoculated grain into a tumbler that will rotate around mixing my spawn into the substrate as it rolls down an, an incline, uh, you know, down a decline to a person waiting on the other end that can put it on a rack for me. So this whole process just keeps getting bigger and bigger the more I want to provide for the community and other farms. And right now, I'm not growing any mushrooms myself. Everything I make is going to other farmers to grow out and grow on, in, in their own communities. Because I'm down. I'm shut down right now in construction. So, Cultures in storage. Uh, the only culture I know of that cannot tolerate refrigeration is the pink oyster mushroom. Everything else needs to be kept down around 44 degrees to keep them basically suspended where they're at. You don't want them to keep growing, outgrow their media, outgrow their food source, and die. So if you keep them refrigerated, you can keep them for, I've heard upwards of five to seven years. I've never kept one past five years before transferring it into a new, petri or a, a new test tube, but that's just personal practice. So to make your own spawn, and I always make grain spawn per bag, and I use uh, Unicorn's 14 A's. Usually, I'm going to try some other bags, but um, to make a five pound block of grain, I start with eight cups of dry grain, 
fill it with water, soak it for 24, and then parboil it for about 10 minutes. You just want to get the grain internally up to temperature because when you strain off all the excess moisture and let it steam off, you want the grain surface to be dry to the touch, but the grain to be saturated with uh, enough moisture to carry the mycelium through its life cycle for you. So once it's steamed off and somewhat dried off to the touch, you can put it in a jar or a bag. That is a wedge of agar, inoculated agar, that I put in there. And those are the size of bags. Um, once it's been, once the grain has been sterilized prior to inoculation, uh, you'll want to impulse seal it in a clean environment where other contaminants that want to grow on your grain uh, will not be able to get in. And you impulse seal it shut after you've inoculated it to keep what you want to grow growing and nothing else. So if you're thinking about adding mushrooms to your farm offerings, uh, the biggest question I would guess would be choosing a substrate. And there are a couple things that you need to decide. What mushrooms do you want to grow? And what do they fruit on? And what's easy? What can you get your hands on? How hard is it to process? How much time is it going to take? How much energy is going to put into doing it? And is this going to be cost effective for your farm? I started out with straw. It was easy to get. I could get it at any garden center. Um, now I can get it from my neighbor if I wanted to grow on straw. Chopping it up is as easy as sending it through a leaf shredder or uh, hitting it with a weed whacker, running it over with a bagged lawn mower. You know, however you want to get it shredded up into pretty fine little pieces. It's cheap, um, easy to pasteurize, and we'll go over that here shortly and it supports nice oyster mushroom fruitings. This is still what I use if I'm going to make a bag kit for a farmer's market. And the reason is so, um, straw is fairly nutrient void. So like I said, mushrooms are only going to fruit once they've run through their food source. My customers at a farmer's market are going to want quick results or they're not going to keep buying from me. So if I make my bag out of straw and the mycelium runs through the straw quick, they're going to get mushrooms quick. Sawdust supports a wider range of mushrooms. Um, it's easy to mix in additives for, for higher flushes. Every time mushrooms produce a fruit body, we refer to it as a flush. So they'll produce more flushes if you give them more energy to put into fruiting once they get down to like oh man I'm running out of food source I better send out some mushrooms to set to produce spores to continue my life cycle that is what we imagine the thought process is like Um, people are finding it easier to use sawdust all the time. Like I said, up to, I don't know, maybe five, six years ago, everybody thought sawdust had to be sterilized. Well, we've done chemical pasteurizations, long-term high temp pasteurizations, uh, where we leave the pressure out of it and uh, still get really fine results. So this was from the good old days in Minneapolis. Shredding it up with a leaf chopper, putting it in a, a hardware cloth wire basket, submerging it with a brick in a 55 gallon drum over a turkey burner hooked up to an LP tank, and heating it up. <coughs> All open air. No special sterilizing equipment for the filtration of the air. Um, you know. How 
pasteurization occurs at 140 to 160 degrees for an hour. Sterilization is 15 PSI, which I forget what that equates out to, but you can't reach it with normal steam. Steam is 212, so you've got to have a closed vessel capable of holding pressure. I think it's like 245 degrees, something like that, for an hour is what you attain at 15 pounds per square inch. So that's what you need to get that water and that straw up to to pasteurize it. My uh, current method, so I had a video showing my mixer and current bagger setup, but you'll see, you'll see it from the outside later. But basically now all I have to do is throw hardwood fuel pellets in this giant mixer, add hot water, which my hot water heater I have cranked up to 150, so could potentially have some benefits for pasteurizing at that level. But that's a water line in the back of this mixer, and there's also one you can't see up front. So I just crank this thing on, have it start mixing hardwood fuel pellets like you'd burn in a stove. As soon as that hot water hits them, they turn to fluff. And then I can mix in bran, soybean holes, whatever n nutrients I want to put in there, and it gets mixed out thoroughly. And the inoculation process of straw is just as easy. Taking colonized grain, breaking it up, and what starts out, boy, I don't want to go that far back. Regular old looking rye, brown, dark brown sometimes will end up looking like styrofoam once the mycelium has grown completely through it. You want to break it back up into the point where there are very small kernels. The more points of inoculation that are in your final substrate, the faster the final substrate will colonize. So if you leave big old chunks of your spawn in the substrate, yeah, it'll work but 10 smaller pieces would have spread to each other quicker. And then get it out of your heat source, and I will tell you, just one 55-gallon drum size wire basket full of straw, I mean, me and Brian couldn't pick it up out of there. So have something overhead to ratchet that sucker out of there or be prepared to pitchfork enough out to where you can get it suspended over some two by fours to let it drip dry the rest of the way out. Hose down an old tarp and throw the rest out on the tarp. We didn't spread alcohol on that. We didn't put bleach down anything. We just rinsed it off in between uses spread it out to let the steam and, and heat escape, and then spawn it real heavy. Like, I, if you make your own spawn, it really doesn't cost you that much. If you're buying spawn, you have to worry about your bottom line, but I didn't, so we just spawned it really heavy. Big chunks, you can see I said not to do it, but I did it. I, I've done a lot of things I'm going to tell you guys not to do. <laughs> and that's how I know. So once it's cooled down to the point you can handle it without any uh, damage to your hand, right around 90 degrees, I think thermal death for most mushrooms is around 109 degrees. So once it's cool enough, you can handle it with your bare hands, spawn it out, stuff it into poly tubes and make what we had a nice three foot long column of inoculated straw. 
wipe down the outside of the bag with isopropyl alcohol, take a, a scratch all, punch a bunch of holes in it for air exchange, set it in a dark place for a while, and forget about it. Once it's fully colonized, goes from looking like bright yellow straw to styrofoam, you're ready to fruit. And those holes that you punch for air exchange are also going to be your future fruiting sites. So there's my mixer. And uh, like I said, I just keep spending more and more money the, the more involved in this I get. That mixer, well, okay, let's start at my pasteurizer. I told you, a lot of people now aren't necessarily sterilizing sawdust. I don't. That's a 196 gallon horse trough. That's a sauna steamer. And the steam from that is pumped into the bottom, which I ha you can kind of see there. I have wire racking. I have a false bottom in there with bricks holding the bottom layer shelf. So the steam goes in under the bottom layer of bags and go steam heat rises. So in the lid of this, I have an escape vent for spent steam to go out through a window. Um, otherwise, it would ruin the sheetrock in that room, and I don't want to go through that. Um, that container will hold 108 five-pound bags at once. Um, that machine will half fill it in one run. So I'm producing, I was producing on average 224 or 324 blocks a week out of the, that setup. And once I get this guy into play, I'll probably be able to double or come close to tripling that because that will increase my workspace where I can inoculate mushroom blocks probably three times the capacity of what I had at my old inoculation space. The glare is really, really bad. But if you look at these pictures online after the fact, if you get on the PFI website and stuff and, and look at this, there are little tiny dots of white in what's otherwise brown bags of sawdust. That's mycelium recovering and jumping off of the grain into the substrate. And that is what looks like styrofoam out of a completely brown uh, sawdust block. So once, they're, once you've inoculated the bags and they're ripping through the substrate, you want to keep them at about 75 to 80 to colonize. And there's a reason for that. You don't have to go that high, but that's what I like to do so I can trick my mushrooms later. And they need no CO2 exchange within the room. You'll see on some of these bags, each bag has a filter patch that I use. That provides enough gas exchange. Um, as mushrooms digest their substrate, they release carbon dioxide. If the carbon dioxide level gets too high, the mycelium will actually choke itself out and die. So you need some gas exchange, um, but that filter patch on that bag is sufficient. So once the there's straw. That was straw at one time. Completely white. You can't break it apart now if you had to. Um, really hard. I mean, you could if you wanted to spend a day at it. But um, once it's fully colonized, to trick your mushrooms into growing, which is what we all want to end up with, Cool them down. So if you're inoculating and colonizing at 80 degrees and you take them outside or set them in your basement for a day or something 
to where it's, it, you know, 65, you, that cold shock is enough to, to make them force fruit almost immediately. Cool them down, decrease the carbon dioxide. So those holes you poked in the bags, that alone has decreased the carbon dioxide in that site. <laughs> so once the bag is fully grown through, the mycelium will search out the oxygen sources as where to grow the mushrooms. Increase humidity and increase light. That's my outside fruiting area in Minneapolis. A couple of PVC pipes, some garden misters from DRAM, one hose connection fed all four corners, 70% shade cloth, and that fence line, this fence line, and my garage was on this side, and this was open to that backyard that you guys saw Brian and I processing straw in. And that's inside my last grow room. Um, I just wanted to talk for a minute about grow rooms because I know the most common desire that people are going to have to go home and try and grow these in their basement and it is doable I did it I don't recommend it unless you can check on your stuff two to three four times a day because in short order those blocks that have nothing growing on them are going to look like that in maybe three to four days total. That's all the quicker it takes to get to that stage. And anything past, where's a really good one? Here. See how flat that guy is right there? That one right there. See how flat that one is? Anything past that, and they're going to start dumping spores. And I mean like icicles will hang down from the gills. And they are sticky and they make a mess and they get all over everything. That's treated lumber. <laughs> yeah, they don't care. <laughs> um, a lot of environmental controls in fruiting. You need to control the temperature, humidity, light, and air exchange. You can spend a lot of money on controls if you want to, meters, things that will read these for you, or the mushrooms will tell you. Those stems are way too long, and to me, that's a sign of either low light, which that picture is no flash, so it's not low light, or high carbon dioxide. What high carbon dioxide means is you need to introduce more fresh air. That's it. The teeth on these lion's mane are developing nicely. There's no pink. There is, if you look online again, once you can take a closer look at these pictures, that lion's mane right there in the background of this picture has a pinkish hue, and that's because there's too high carbon dioxide. So if you know what you're looking for, the mushrooms will tell you these things and you don't have to invest all that money in sensors and stuff. People ask me all the time, how much can I expect out of one block? You know, because that's what I deal with now is sawdust blocks, five pound sawdust blocks. I tell them I expect out of my own personal blocks no less than one pound per first flush. Second flush, maybe a half pound. Third flush, maybe a quarter pound. But there are days where 1.48 pound clusters, almost one and a half pound clusters off of a single block from a single hole. This cluster is coming out of the front of a bag, and this cluster is out of the top of the same bag. This cluster off the front has already been harvested, and this cluster is out of the same bag. So that was a top fruiting cluster 
out of the top of one bag. I don't know, I didn't keep track of what came out of the front or even if I did front fruit it. And marketing, what are you gonna do with all these mushrooms if you grow them out? Um, I would talk to chefs ahead of time. Unfortunately, in our area, there may not be the education of the chefs that I had in Minneapolis. And even if the education is there, the clientele base may not justify you growing Piapinos for an Italian restaurant. If their customers won't eat it in their risotto, then they won't buy it. Start small and grow with your demand. Um, I have a friend in Missouri who has probably over $500,000 investments from other people that he now has to answer for on a weekly basis because he thought his demand would be there and luckily for him it is. But uh, to jump in like that to something that you didn't research, it would kill me. Um, know your local market. If you're already a vendor, you have the greatest resource already. Talk to the people that come to your booth. If you know someone that runs a market, hey, what do you think your, you know, the, the people that come down to your farmer's market would say if somebody showed up with some mushrooms? You know, do you already have somebody doing it? Would I already have competition right off the bat? Uh, toughen up your skin and get ready for stupidity to ensue. Oh, you girl mushrooms, what kind of mushrooms? <laughs> You're not unique at all. I get that question every single week. <laughs> and prepare to educate. Um, like I said, we're meat and potato country. If people are afraid of mushrooms because they don't have exposure to them, it's going to take longer for them to want to come around and have anything to do with them. The best education I have, and I can do this at my farmer's market because we're pretty lenient, samples can be given away for free. You have to have certification to sell cooked food. But you do not have to have certification to give away cooked food. So a little Coleman stove and a cast iron skillet, a little olive oil, saute, garlic, onion, oyster mushrooms, and just wait for people to come. <laughs> <laughs> and that's literally it. I have little, little plates, paper plates, and plastic forks or toothpicks. Oh, go ahead, try some. Spatula them up a little bit, send them away, wait about half an hour, they'll come back. So if you do want to target restaurants, which is not your highest markup, your highest markup is probably always going to be farmer's markets, restaurants second, grocery chains bottom. Like that's bulk, you're talking re, uh, you know, wholesale sales at that point. But uh, chefs love visuals. If you wanna hook a restaurant, put together a nice little basket, a couple pounds, one or two varieties, any other pertinent information. Hey, and I also grow a lot of basil and thyme and oregano, things like that that you might be interested in. Put that all together, hand it to them, wait for their call. Like I said, spores do irreparable damage to your woodwork. That's the number one reason I don't like to grow them indoors, but like I said, I've done it. I, a lot of people I know <laughs> have done it, and you can get away with it. But they also do irreparable damage to your lungs. So please wear a breathing apparatus if you get to a semi, uh, a level of growing which is, you know, semi-professional uh, or like you're, you're doing it for a steady income. 
and they're a big time suck. If, like I said, if you can't check on them two, three times a day, this may not be for you because they can go from perfect mushrooms to full blown out and dumping spores in a matter of four or five hours. Um, and the, like I said, with the chefs, there might be a break in period associated with buying. You may need to educate them what to do with them, how to use them, or give them time to figure it out on their own. And this video covers a lot of basics, including what I am going to try and do, not in ground, but my next grow room will be a metal shipping container. Spores do a lot of irreparable damage to wood, not metal. So that'll be my next project. And let's uh, see if we have any questions. Thank you all for coming. Yes. Can you tell me what was, uh, where did the $8,000 cost come from in that thing? And what was the deal about the HEPA filter? Could you repeat the question? Oh, oh, gotcha. Sorry. <laughs> I've never been to one of these before. What was the $8,000 buildup and what was the HEPA filter for? Um, it was a package deal from Fungi Perfect Eye. They just put together a list of lab supplies that they think you're going to need to get started and, and discount it slightly. Um, and the HEPA filter is to filter out any airborne particulate matter that might cause contaminants in your workspace. So basically it sucks air out of the room, sends it through the filter, and you do all of your nice clean work in front of that while it's blowing at you. So any, and I guess one thing to note, don't hang a light right above your HEPA filter. Always work in front of a light, because if dirt touches a light, it drops. It gets electrostatically charged and it drops straight down. So if your filter's in front of a light and something were to drop down, it's already out of your workspace. Yes. Yep. So does the type of substrate you use and the amount of flushes you get have an impact on the flavor? I haven't noticed any, but I've never grown on, say, cherry wood or something aromatic like that. Um, it's always a generic hardwood mix, like I said, those fuel pellets, or um, oak logs, which a lot of those are potentially oak uh, to begin with. You can buy specific oak hardwood fuel pellets or straw. And I, between the two, wood grown and straw grown, taste I have not noticed a difference texture I have sawdust grown mushrooms and definitely log grown mushrooms if you inoculate a, a true wood log with sawdust inoculant a much denser mushroom than straw yes shut down no, um, but oyster mushrooms especially will overwinter. Um, I had a friend go around and he was determined to grow oyster mushrooms on straw in five gallon buckets. And uh, I was like, yeah, let's do it. I'll provide you all, this, all the spawn you need. So he owned a farm and had plenty of horses. So he had plenty of straw. Went around collecting buckets from every source he could get pickle buckets from the grocery stores and delis, anything. Cleaned them up, drilled holes in them. I had him what is commonly called the seven day soak. You submerge straw for seven days, it goes anaerobic, you drain off the water, it goes back to aerobic and kills off all the anaerobic stuff. Basically leaves you with a neutral substrate. Anyway, you can layer it straw, spawn straw spawn straw spawn and he packed these buckets full 
like 50, 60 buckets full. And uh, then it got cold. He said, Tyson, these aren't fruiting yet. I said, oh, give it time, give it time. Tyson, these aren't fruiting yet. Well, I, I can't make them go any faster. <laughs> Winter came around. Tyson, they never fruit, and I'm going to throw them out. I said, no. We, just, do you ha are they in your way? No. Just leave them. Spring rolls. We worked together. So spring rolls around. He comes in one day just beaming from ear to ear. You'll never guess what happened. I said, you got mushrooms, didn't you? Yep. They had overwintered, frozen solid, and then reanimated come warmer weather. Yes. Can you give us an idea of the retail price ranges on the various sites, you know, from Champion and Lance to Lance? How much is your time worth? The question was, could you give us an idea on retail um, prices between the different things? You set your own price. I was having a discussion about this earlier. A guy and I were talking about going into business. We decided. $10 a pound for oysters. That's what we're going to start at, and that's what we're going to do. Three weeks later, when I was getting ready to make some sales with him, I said, all right, let's go. Here's some mushrooms, $10 a pound, right? He goes, well, I've, I've been selling to some places at 7. I said, all right, we're not doing business anymore. So you set your line in the sand, and you stick with it. I found places willing to pay 10 so I bought from him at 7 and resold him at 10. <laughs> yes? You, can you reuse old substrate to inoculate new stuff? You can, but the likelihood of a contamination goes up every time you do that. Uh, the the reason is the mycelium has already expended a lot of energy in fruiting. And over time, just like we get older, <coughs> mushrooms go through senescence. So if I buy a strain, if I buy a test tube in a strain, and I take a piece out and I put it on a petri dish, that petri dish grows out. I can take a piece of that petri dish and start another petri dish. Well, if I keep doing it down the line, down, 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 further and further, and taking from that very first piece I took out of that test tube, eventually my yield's going to tank. It's just going to get old and weak and not perform the way I want it to. So you can, and especially if you take spent, say, sawdust blocks and bury them under some wood chips, are you going to get a ton of mushrooms? Probably not, but are you going to get a nice bonus? In the spring and the fall, yeah, sure, that'll probably work. Yes. Um, <coughs> no, because they are not. What? Oh, are there any inspections, certifications you need to sell to restaurants? The answer is no, because they are not wild mushrooms. The only wild mushroom you're allowed to sell in Iowa is the morel if you have a certification class taken, but you're not selling a wild mushroom, you're selling cultivated mushroom. It's no different than if somebody wanted to sell wild ramps versus garden-grown onions. You know, it's similar items, but they're not the same. Some restaurants will require it, but there are plenty that won't. That's their, as far as I know, that's their thing. No. <laughs> well, I, t I talked to the, the person in charge of Iowa, Minnesota, and Wisconsin for the uh, FDA, and he said no. But that was years ago, and I haven't asked again since. <laughs> yes. Uh, you mentioned the seven day soak. Is that an alternative to pasteurization? Like For straw, yeah, the, the seven day soak. Um, is it an alternative to pasteurization? Basically, what you're doing by submerging it is killing off all aerobic activity. 
anything that needs oxygen to live, you're killing it by submerging it for seven days. And then when you drain it off, you're killing off everything that thrived under anaerobic conditions. So you basically left it neutral. Yes? Um, about harvest and handling and taking it to restaurants, you are allowed without a food processing license one cut. You can cut the mushroom away from the block or column or whatever you're growing on. That's not the same as a hand tear. Like if you, and, and if you were to ever grow mushrooms and just place them in a box and drive down the road with them, they'll break into smaller clusters for you. <laughs> so, as far as getting them into smaller units, that's really not an issue. But you're not allowed to dice them up and sell, sell them as diced mushrooms. But yeah, they'll br I mean, let them decide. At, when I go to farmer's market, it's easier for me to j carry, you know, several large containers of mushrooms, and they look way cooler, too. And then just if somebody's like, oh, I don't want a whole pound, all right, tear off what you want. Let them do it. Yes? Storage, length of time, temperature, humidity. In a standard refrigerator, for oyster mushrooms in a brown paper bag, what I do is take a paper towel, get it wet, wring out everything I can, open the paper bag, put in my mushrooms, put in the wrung out paper towel, and fold the paper bag over once, stick it in the refrigerator. I'd say seven, five to seven days, no problem. Before you sell them? Before they need to be used. Yes. Uh, I didn't catch uh, when you put the when you're growing the stuff in the mushroom or in the sawdust or the straw. Do you add something to feed the mushrooms, or is that they get all the food from the substrate? Do you need to add supplements to straw or sawdust? You don't have to, but it's boosting the potential of whatever, doing the best you can. It's like, you know, taking vitamins. If you, if your diet's a little poor, you're not going to perform as well. So what is it you're adding? Soybean holes, wheat bran, and that's only to the sawdust. I don't add anything to the straw because I want it to fruit quick. And all the adding nutrients does is it can increase your yield, but it prolongs fruiting because then they have more energy, more food to stay as mycelium and not fruit. Yes? Are there any mistakes you could make that would result in toxic mushrooms misidentification? If you're buying spawn or you're buying a known culture, I mean, you'll see if there's black or green present. It should be bright white mycelium the whole way. If you get a little bit of yellowing, that might be just metabolites that the mycelium's pushing out from its food substrate as it digests. But any yellow, green, or orange, green, black, blue, toss it. Yes. Log-grown mushrooms versus bag culture or column culture. Logs are a long-term commitment. Um, and certain mushrooms in the way I do it are a long-term commitment to me. My real estate's really valuable because I want to turn and burn mushrooms and make sales. Logs, I've heard of shiitake logs not even showing pins 
for three to five years. Shiitakes in sawdust blocks, two to three months. Oyster mushrooms, lion mushrooms, two to three weeks. So based on that, I mean, you can get out of a log spring and fall flushes if you don't force fruit. Just let nature do its thing. Spring and fall flushes for five to seven years. Or you could be burning through thousands and thousands of pounds of substrate and thousands and thousands of pounds of mushrooms in that same amount of time. Yeah? Uh, were there some other types of mushrooms that were worth, you're worth telling us about? Other mushrooms worth telling us about? Um, lion's mane is a very tasty mushroom, reminiscent of a cross between lobster and shrimp. Um, Piapino is nutty and crunchy and often used in risottos. Um, I mean, I have 25 different mushroom cultures, but oysters are the fastest and easiest sell, so that's mainly what I spend my time with. Yes? Can you cultivate morels? Yeah, sure. Can I personally? No, haven't tried. Won't bother to try because the Chinese have just started releasing information on how they do it. And by the time it, there are so many steps involved, by the time you touch it, every time you touch it and do something to it, that adds cost. So where does it not become profitable anymore? And there is the black morel and the blushing morel that are saprophytic that will grow on just wood chip beds. But how much time and effort do you want to put into, eh, maybe. So, and I've heard they don't taste the same either. Um, so, great. You end up with 100 pounds of mushrooms. Somebody buys one pound from you, and they're like, oh, these aren't that good. And that word of mouth spreads, then you're stuck with X amount of pounds that nobody wants because they, they don't taste the same. So, Thank you for coming. <laughs>